Hi, my name is Mitch Cox, and I'm from the University of the Witwatersrand, or just Wits University, in Johannesburg, South Africa. Today, I'm going to talk to you about structuring light with digital micromirror devices, which are a type of spatial light modulator. Even if you don't know what I mean by structured light, I hope that by the end of this talk, you'll have more of an inkling and perhaps a new tool to use in your own work. So how do we convert a Gaussian beam into something more interesting? Perhaps with a structured spatial intensity, phase, and even polarization. I'll start this talk with a brief introduction to what I mean by structured light. The tool of choice for many in the field are liquid crystal spatial light modulators. I'll discuss how these are used in more detail later, but more importantly, can we use something different? Can we use an array of tiny mirrors to control an incident laser beam and modulate the phase and polarization of that beam along with the intensity as one would expect from a mirror? The answer is yes. And my objective in this talk is to briefly explain how. But first, let's start with structured light. Non-structured laser beams are everywhere. We know these as the Gaussian or almost Gaussian beams, which are produced by a laser pointer, as I would have been using had this talk been in person. These beams are also used for many other applications, such as optical communications, light shows, and even industrial applications like laser cutting. Structured light, on the other hand, can be loosely defined as beams that have an intentionally designed intensity, phase, and even polarization structure. On this slide are a few examples of structured light. The colorful intensities of various beams are shown with grayscale spatial phases behind them. As you may notice, where the phase jumps abruptly from one value to another, such as the checkerboard pattern on the bottom left, the intensity tends to be lower or even zero. There is an intrinsic relationship between the intensity and phase of a laser beam. There are numerous applications that benefit from the use of structured light, with a few examples on this slide. Structured light can be used to determine the chirality of molecules and make various other metrology-related measurements. It can be used to improve the resolution and contrast in microscopy. It can be used to create stronger particle traps and even manipulate particles by rotating them. And finally, it can be used in optical communications as a convenient way to harness the space degree of freedom. Orbital angular momentum is a particularly popular higher order spatial mode. We can see the intensity and phase of OAM modes along the top row of this image. OAM is just the tip of the iceberg though. There are an infinite number of spatial modes, some no doubt more useful than others, but many still to be properly investigated. For example, OAM modes can be thought of as a subset of the Laguerre Gauss modes, where OAM is the azimuthal index L. There is a second index, the radial index, which we give as P, which adds another dimension to the picture here. I'm particularly interested in modes that can propagate in free space. I do my research in long-range wireless optical communications with a particular focus on harnessing structured light. The modes on this slide each have their advantages and disadvantages, but many are not yet fully explored. I'm not going to go into detail on these mode sets as each would take a talk on its own. But the take home here is that structured light is a vast field and having a good tool to manipulate it in the lab is crucial. A particularly interesting type of structured light are called vector modes. These are spatial modes, much like what I've shown you already, except they also have a spatially varying polarization. Most of the time when we refer to spatial modes, we assume a uniform scalar polarization. Vector vortex modes are shown here. These have many interesting properties, one of which is that OAM phase and polarization, as described by the equation, are non-separable. By changing which modes we couple with each, with which polarization, we can create interesting shapes in all three degrees of freedom. At this point, you're probably wondering how to create these modes in the lab, so let's move on to that. Allow me to focus on non-vectorial structured light for now. We can generate higher order modes by taking an initial Gaussian or an expanded flat wave front beam and reflecting it off or perhaps passing it through a hologram. It's obviously convenient if this hologram can be computer generated. This is what we see in this photo, where all the reflected orders are visible. So how does this work? So if we take a small step back, let's consider a conventional way to generate an OAM mode. If we shine a Gaussian beam through a so-called spiral phase plate, we get an OAM beam. Since the speed of light is different in glass compared to air, parts of the beam which travel different distances through different thicknesses of glass will acquire a certain phase shift compared to other parts of the beam. 
As an aside, the phase of the center is undefined here, and so we don't find any light there either. We can look at this picture differently. Instead of a 3D piece of glass, we can visualize the spatial phase shift directly as we see on the right, where the color represents phase. For OAM, beams are defined by the azimuthal index L, which I've said before. These can have any number of integer twists. In grayscale, these phases are shown on the right with associated intensity patterns below. Different modes have different phase and intensity patterns. Now, if we want to impart this phase onto an incoming Gaussian beam, which has a flat phase, can we just encode this phase pattern onto a spatial light modulator? Liquid crystal spatial light modulators are made up of many pixels, each of which can be set to modulate the phase shift of the light at that point to a specific value. Often these SLMs can achieve a 0 to 2 pi phase shift, represented as black and white on the phase image. This seems intuitive, but will it work? The answer is no. Unfortunately, no SLM is 100% efficient, and so some light from the incoming beam will be combined with the light that has been successfully modulated by the SLM. This would result in a beam that is not what we're expecting. There is a solution though. We can use a grating to tilt the modulated light away from the zero order which is unmodulated. The light we find in this new first order must have been modulated by the SLM and is thus the result of our hologram. This grating acts as a linear phase ramp to tilt the beam to a specific location. The reason why it is a stripy look in this picture, to put it quite crudely, is because the phase ramp must be modulo 2 pi so that it works on the liquid crystal SLM. This approach is very conventional. We require a spatial filter to select only the first order, and we block everything else. This is a schematic drawing, which isn't drawn to scale, obviously, where we use two lenses in a so-called 4F system, with a pinhole placed at the center to do this selection. Is a liquid crystal SLM the only device suitable for this task? Since the talk is about digital micromirror devices, you probably guessed that the answer is no. We can use a DMD instead of an LC SLM, I will now explain where one can find a DMD and how to use it for holographic purposes. DMDs are very common. They are found in many digital light projectors. For a projection of color image, they rapidly switch between red, green and blue colors. And for each color, the mirrors are digitally oriented to reflect that color light through the projection optics. In modern DLP systems, colored LEDs or lasers are used instead of a color wheel like we see here. Besides commercial devices, a variety of DMD evaluation modules are available from vendors. There are two of my favorite DMD devices here. On the left is a Pico DMD, the DLP4710, which comes with projection optics which have to be removed for laser SLM use. In the inset image below, you can see a photo of the actual DMD chip. To the right is a more expensive DMD evaluation module, which needs very little modification for use in a setup as I described earlier. Both of these DMDs have a 1920 by 1080 resolution, which we often know as Full HD. I've successfully modified this DMD evaluation module with some 3D printed components and slight firmware tweaks to disable the LEDs to orient the DMD so that, it can use, um, so that we can use it as an SLM in my lab. I've published the instructions and the repository of files so that you can do it yourself if you desire. Before I explain how to generate holograms for a DMD, it helps to ex understand exactly what a DMD is, as well as its advantages and disadvantages. A DMD is an array of tiny aluminium, although I imagine the material could be different if required, mirrors, with a close-up photo shown at the top right. Each mirror can be individually tilted left or right, relatively speaking. In the off state, the mirrors rest flat. Internally, a patented electrostatic mechanism is used to tilt the mirrors and suffice to say, each mirror can change state very quickly. The first advantage of using metal mirrors is that they are polarization insensitive. Any polarization state will be reflected, unlike liquid crystal SLMs, which only work with horizontal polarization. Another benefit is that they are relatively wavelength insensitive. Aluminium is reflective over a large range of wavelengths. Any wavelength related issues are likely to come from the glass window covering the DMD. Often this window is coated to prevent spurious reflections in a specific range, such as visible wavelengths, and use outside of this range can result in unexpected or undesired reflections.
A third major advantage of DMDs over LC SLMs is that they generally support a very fast refresh rate. At minimum, 60 Hz is possible, as this is a standard refresh rate over an HDMI display connection. Knowledge of how the DMD works can be harnessed to increase this rate further, which I'll discuss soon. If a user doesn't want to display holograms on a DMD over an HDMI connection, some DMD evaluation modules have onboard memory which can be preloaded with several hundred patterns and displayed at kilohertz rates. The last major benefit of a DMD over an LC SLM is that they're generally mass produced and therefore quite cost effective for the average user. Of course, if you're able to source individual components and create custom designs, this statement may not apply to you. There are some significant disadvantages of DMDs though. The first is that they're amplitude only devices and cannot modulate the phase of light on a pixel by pixel basis like you can with a liquid crystal SLM. This doesn't prevent us from using a DMD to do this though. Unfortunately, the compromise is that when DMDs are used to modulate the phase of a laser beam, they are very inefficient with a maximum of about 5% of the light ending up in the first order. Lastly, because a DMD is made up of many reflective surfaces, there can be many more diffraction spots than with a liquid crystal SLM. This can make experimental setup arrangements slightly more challenging. As I mentioned, a DMD is designed to modulate the amplitude of light, pixel by pixel, and not the phase. So how can we use it to modulate phase? The answer lies in binary amplitude holograms, which were invented in the 70s. An example of one such hologram is shown at the center of this slide for a Laguerre gauss L equals 1, P equals 0 mode. As usual, we rely on filtering out the first order to retrieve the field we are interested in generating. Let's call this field U. Here I'm using Cartesian coordinates X and Y, but it's not important to my explanation of how to generate one of these holograms. U is a complex field with an amplitude A and a phase psi. The transmission function for this hologram is given by T. We can break down this into four main parts. The desired amplitude and phase are encoded by the functions P and W to the right of the expression. We have a phase ramp term, which is used to direct the first order away from the zero order. And finally, a sine function is used to clamp the values on the range zero to one. If we examine this further, the, gener the functions P and W are simple manipulations of the A and Psi of the desired field. P is the phase and W is the arc sine of the normalized amplitude of the field. Using the holograms produced by this expression, we can modulate the phase and intensity of an incoming laser beam using an amplitude only device such as a DMD. As I mentioned earlier, a DMD is relatively fast device, especially when holograms are loaded onto onboard memory. This functionality isn't always available though. If the black and white holograms are displayed on the DMD, assuming the DMD is from a standard DLP system, as shown on the bottom left, what is actually happening is that the DMD is sequentially displaying three identical images, one for red, one for green, and one for blue. This would produce white light on the projection system. We can take advantage of this and encode three different holograms, one on each color channel, resulting in the hologram on the bottom right. If this is displayed over HDMI, the DMD will sequentially display each of the three different holograms. If the user is able to display these combined holograms at the 60 Hz limit of the HDMI on a typical DMD valuation module, an overall rate of 180 Hz is possible with no modifications. There are sometimes ways to update a DMD over HDMI at an even faster rate. Some DMD systems, such as the DLP4710 evaluation module I showed you earlier, allow a special bitwise encoding to sustain a 1440 Hz hologram rate. Let's move on to how we can generate vector modes with the DMD. As I mentioned before, vector modes are a superposition of two different modes on two different polarizations. This is quite difficult to do using a liquid crystal SLM as several wave plates would need to be used. Predictably, our standard mode generation setup won't work for this as there is only one path and thus one polarization possible in this setup. There are a number of experimental setups that can work to generate vector modes, but this is my new favorite, which was published last year. Here, an incoming laser beam is split into its two polarization components by a Wollaston prism or a polarizing beam splitter 
A quarter wave plate is used to convert these linear polarizations into circular polarizations as required for the vector vortex beams shown at the bottom of the slide. A 4F lens system focuses the two beams onto the surface of the DMD. We use two superimposed holograms, one for each mode of the DMD as shown to the right. The zero orders for each incoming beam will reflect in different directions, and so will the encoded first orders which we're interested in. If we tweak the grating angle and direction of these superimposed holograms, we can make the first orders co-propagate. After the usual spatial filter, we're left with a computer-generated vector mode. In summary, we can use DMDs to effectively modulate three different degrees of freedom of an incoming laser beam, intensity, phase, and to some extent, even polarization. DMDs are readily available and quite cost-effective, but unfortunately, they have low light efficiency. I hope that you learned something from this talk and maybe even are looking forward to add a new tool to your experimental arsenal. Thank you very much.